Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I know that we've had some technical difficulties, so we don't have our full panel here yet, but hopefully um, we will be able to get everyone. Um, at time. Um, I edit coverage from around the world. Um, in particular, I'm really interested in technology um, and this conversation today is something that we're all living and breathing. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. Um, I also just want to start by acknowledging the tragedy of Tuesday night's shootings in Atlanta. Um, this was a really horrible moment for many in the Asian community and around the world. Um, I also therefore want to apologize in advance that I am quite sleep deprived having worked on our coverage um, through the night. And so sorry in advance if my brain is a little bit muddled today. Um, we're obviously here to talk about something really different. So I'm just going to get us going. Um, prior to the pandemic, the digital transformation was underway in countless industries. But the COVID-19 crisis has really accelerated this transformation. There's a new urgency uh, for digitally connecting people, objects, devices. It's been a reality check for all the businesses that have struggled to embrace that. Today, we're going to talk about where we go from here, how this is already shaping our society, what the future looks like. Um, I'm joined by several great speakers today. I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves and speak for a couple of minutes about how the work you do and how COVID-19 disruption has accelerated this urgency. Um, for attendees, if you have questions, drop them in the chat, um, we'll weave them into the discussion as well as having some time at the end. Um, so let me start uh, with Dennis. Um, I've asked everyone to mute when they're not speaking, so I will mute. Thank you, Naina. So uh, I'm a vice president with Enterprise Management Associates. We're an analyst firm in technology. I've been in tech since 1981 when I started with IBM and 20 years as an analyst. Um, my focus in the last 10 has been to look at trends across IT and how IT aligns with the business, which includes automation, analytics like AI ops and observability, and digital transformation, which is a big part of that. All three are intertwined um, in tech. Uh, before that, I was at Yale, an anthropology major. Uh, I've had a novel published, in political satire. Um, and I've actually worked in running a prison workshop on writing, so I'm interested in education as well. I thought I'd begin um, with a very quick sense of, you know, what I've learned in tech, and I'm taking it from uh, a research that was completed uh, in January uh, on focusing on information security and technology. Just a few data points, I'll be quick. Uh, kind of shows you where I live and work uh, in tech. Uh, when we looked at the impact of COVID on our technical workers, we saw that before 2019, 17% worked from home, 59% now, quite a jump, and 34% are going to continue uh, working from home. 33% see their physical office space reduced, um, and 26% were saving, uh, the companies were saving money. On the business side, 86% discovered new ways of delivering goods and services, and I'm sure we'll be saying a lot about that today. 40% saw growth. Uh, on the tech front, 71% uh, saw cloud migration, and 49% saw increase in security incidents. We actually have data on what devices people are being are using. You know, business-owned laptop PC was the number one. Business-owned desktop was number two business-owned phone, but it went right on down a lot of employee-owned equipment. And what's interesting to show that people are using both, both business-owned and employee-owned, trying to keep up. Um, a lot of the things I look at are things like um, sharing data, the challenges of common insights and making decisions from common insights, and the politics that get involved with that. Um, effective automation, uh, which I'm sure we'll touch on in terms of Job security is probably getting a little more tentative thanks to the uh, pandemic uh, and the growth of automation. And uh, 
you know, the office had a sort of role of being democratizing that uh, people with more resources working from home uh, have a more privileged base. So a um, lot of things to touch on, including education. Uh, I've seen things affecting younger children, my, my daughter. Um, my best hopes going forward are indeed for more versatility, more choices, uh, and more sensitivity to job creation and job transition. Sorry to take so long, Nina, but there you have it. No, that's great. And it gives us lots of jumping off points, I think, for this discussion. Um, Hassan, I'm going to try you and see if your audio is working. Right. Can you yes. hear me now? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow I was able to join from my uh, phone and my computer obviously last minute decided to crash the mic or whatnot. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm uh, very glad to be here. My name is Hassan Arif. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Abnectar. We are a uh, uh, essentially a digital shop uh, here helping primarily small to mid-sized businesses and nonprofit organizations uh, based out of Washington, D.C. and been around for seven years. Um, COVID specifically has been uh, quite impactful across the board as far as uh, everything that we do and everything that we see and, and all the customers that we serve. So it, it's been quite interesting uh, to see the sort of spike in uh, in adoption for something that a lot of traditional business owners that were particularly, uh, uh, you know, categorized as small businesses were not taking seriously. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the ones that we were working with were, by virtue of working with us, were prepared. And uh, we saw upwards of about uh, anywhere from like 300 to 400% increase in the amount of activity and engagement as it relates to the various different channels for these small, small to mid-sized organizations, whether it be ordering for restaurants, whether it be booking online for uh, our, you know, our, our, our folks that are our, our, our customers in the healthcare space, whether it be uh, chiropractors or even uh, therapists, um, psychologists, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, been, it's been quite interesting to see a lot of these small business owners take on that um, uh, leadership role within their space uh, in, in really trying to adapt and then also uh, compete with the larger brands who traditionally do have the resources and have had the resources, whether it's an Amazon or, or a Nike, uh, Starbucks, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I'm very excited to talk not only about the business side of things, but we also work with quite a bit of nonprofit organizations where unfortunately, uh, one of the trends that we've seen, particularly in the domestic violence space, has been an increase in, in, in domestic violence. Wow. And uh, I certainly want to uh, talk a little bit about that to generate hopefully some awareness around the topic, particularly as it relates to COVID, but also talk about a project that we're uh, working on that, that is uh, supposed to essentially help the survivors that are impacted by this. I'm really glad you, you raised that. It's something that um, we've been covering at time. And I think people people forget that just um, other kinds of violence might have been different in the pandemic. But I think particularly the effect of lockdowns and, and the added stress of what this pandemic has meant for so many people has created different kinds of strains that have manifested in the home. Um, I'm excited to hear more about how the work you're doing with, with the nonprofit. Um, Tommy, I'll turn it to you. Excellent. Great to be with you. Thanks. Um, so my name is Tommy Weir. I'm the founder and CEO of Enable. And what we do is we help companies and employees to work smarter, uh, to get better and to achieve more. So what we did is we built a um, recognizing that companies have what's potentially one of the greatest underutilized data sets in the world, which is actually the uh, terabytes of data that are created on a daily basis from their employees. Our AI learns how employees work without having to do the human observation. And then what it does is it makes recommendations to them on what they can do to get better, to work smarter and to achieve more. And uh, COVID has been in the midst of this uh, tremendously impactful and stirred up uh, 
a multitude of different debates. And the impact aspect of it is, is it definitely sounded the productivity wake up call. So coming into productivity, sorry, coming into COVID, productivity was flat. And then all of a sudden, 12 months ago, everybody in the world recognized it was flat and uh, started to take differing measures. The downside of that is we moved into to a couple of areas that happen simultaneously with it. One is we moved into this concept of monitoring, which is uh, the most ridiculous thing that you could possibly think about doing. Um, however, that doesn't negate the fact that AI can be the benefit and can actually learn to help you get better. In addition to that, there's a couple of realizations that have come out in the midst of it that are quite uh, alarming um, and we need to be very cautious about. One is while there's a lot of self-report information of people saying they're more productive now than they were uh, pre-COVID, the, the reality is they may, they're accomplishing the same amount of work, but yet they're working an extra hour and a half a day to do that. And this is leading to increased stress. It's leading to burnout rates um, that are probably the highest that we've ever seen in the workforce today. Uh, I believe it's 24 percent of employees are contemplating leaving their job after the market opens back up just because of the stress of burnout that's been created. In addition to that, and this is specifically true for the millennial generation, is they're not getting the level of development support that they would have gotten the apprenticeship or the cubicle coaching or being with the coworkers beside them pre-COVID. And what it's done is it's opened an opportunity to actually realize that AI is not an enemy in the workforce. It's not man versus machine. Sorry, man versus machine. It's man and machine. And being able to take that data to help employees to actually achieve what they want to do, to work smarter, to shorten the elongating work days, and to really kind of even there's some major health benefits in it. Uh, than before, but we're actually spending much longer at our desks than we ever used to and, and the way that that can lead to burnout. Um, Ken, I'll turn it over to you to for our final intro. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, Nena. Uh, this is a great uh, pleasure to, uh, to be with you. Uh, I'm a founder and CEO of Trade of Inc. We're a big startup, a small multinational company spread out in the uh, US, China, and Europe. Uh, we have two sides of businesses. One is on the blockchain side, which is not relevant to this conversation. We develop blockchain technology for like uh, international money remittance, uh, credit cards like those. But one side of business very related to this. We also run like a business social network. So what it does is we connect business people in, this, like, in scenarios like this. Um, we have about 40 people. Uh, this pandemic actually has been a boost for our company. Uh, you shoot up our capital reserve because we have a lot of Bitcoin. Um, it actually reduced our cost because we cancel our rent. Uh, you know, that would save us actually 100K um, because we can work remotely. So we work, uh, actually, it's very relevant to us because all of our U.S. team, uh, they work from home. And we have a team in, uh, in Europe and also a team in China. We, work, we integrate it very well. We see productivity. Um, so one of the things I prepare for this app, I'm sorry, I have to... Hold on a second. Um, is that I have prepared a group on the, one of the products we developed is called Dove Card. Um, it allows you to exchange business cards during video calls like this. So any one of you can scan with this with your camera and download download the app, quickly register, and uh, and after this, I'll show this again. So you can get all the contact information of our panel, including myself. Okay, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I I. You know, I grew up in China, came to the States about 30 years ago, uh, went to MIT, very close to you, uh, Dennis. Uh, I studied technology, uh, electrical engineering, and then uh, got an MBA uh, in finance. Um, yeah, I used to work for like Deutsche Bank, um, you know, PepsiCo, and those. So thanks so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Th and thank you all for being here. And oh, just in time. Great. Um, so sorry about this, Ted. I think uh, it turns out this appeared in his calendar at 6 p.m. rather than right now. So, um, But we just finished the intro, so this is a perfect time for you to join us and tell us a bit about 
who you are, the work you do, and, and what this kind of broader topic means for you. Sure. So I'm Ted Waz, and I'm uh, vice chairman and on the board of directors for the G20 uh, Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion for the World Economic Development Council for Smart and Digital Cities. Uh, we're an organization uh, started by the World Business Angel Fund, and we have 127 countries, and we work on how uh, the advanced digital technologies can support cities and towns in a wide variety of capacities from AI to machine learning, IoT, mobile, uh, all the way down to blockchain distributed ledger technologies, uh, mesh, and node chain. So a lot of different types of things. That's great. Thank you. And I think um, maybe the first question I have would, um, whoever wants to respond, I think it applies to everyone here. You know, the, there are so many different dimensions for how this digital transformation is affecting all of us. We're all living it right now. We're dealing with it in our own ways. It's not an abstract concept. Um, what I would love to start us talking about is the way in which COVID is exact has exacerbated or, or maybe not pre-existing inequalities around the digital divide. How can we close that gap? I know in some ways it's made things more accessible. For example, um, many in the disability space have talked about how things that were previously not accessible to them are much more accessible now. At the same time, there are lots of people without good technology who are kind of locked out of this this transformation. So I'll open the floor and whoever wants to, to speak to Well, I'll actually jump in. So I have a, a couple of roles, and one is as a healthcare informaticist. And what I can share is that uh, COVID uh, globally has had uh, an accelerating and a retarding impact on the delivery of healthcare services. So in the United States, what we've seen is the elimination of barriers for the promotion of telehealth, which has been a wonderful thing. Um, there's been an alignment of medical resources, uh, all to try to get outreach to folks in a way that prior to the onset of the pandemic was not allowed. And it wasn't allowed because of technology issues. It was allowed because of bureaucratic and administrative issues. Now, so the pandemic accelerated acceptance of that in the United States. Conversely, there is a huge population that does not have access to internet, to computers, to mobile devices, uh, to doctors and nurses of any sort. So while I, I do a lot of work in the health and health administration space in the United States, I also do work in India. And so um, where, where there's not a, a large internet presence on a good portion of the continent, um, what we see is a, a lot of uh, a lot of cutting off of medical services because previously they, they had community centers and now there's not the travel to the community centers because of the isolation associated with the pandemic. And that's just one example from the healthcare space. In the, uh, in the workforce, initially COVID and the remote work and these hybrid experiments that we're doing became a great mm -hmm. divider, putting distance between, mm -hmm. uh, between employees employees and managers and the support that they needed. What AI is actually doing is it's closing that divide and bringing in, bringing the actual, um, can I call it the equalizer into everybody's hands. So rather than historically, one of the things that really affected uh, equality in a workforce would come back to the level of support you got and specifically from your manager. And as we know that humans um, have subjective bias and we like people and don't like people and we interact with people and don't interact with people. Um, with the right, correctly designed AI, that bias can be re re removed and all of a sudden instantaneously you can get the support in your hand and you can take control of your growth and your development. You can take control of what you achieve. You can take control of your career uh, progression by getting actually the insights you need to get better in your hand rather than relying on somebody who gives them to you a couple of times a year and a kind of a shoddy performance management re review uh, with the biases in it. So it's a great equalizer inside that aspect. I think that that's super interesting. Can you 
can you walk us through a bit more what that actually looks like? What does it mean to be kind of, what would your career look like if that was a fundamental model that was shaping it rather than an individual? So I'll speak for myself, okay? So obviously I'm in my career and in the same job, but if I was to look back quarter by quarter, and this, and obviously I'm using our product in this, so I'm not trying to promote in that statement though. What it's helped me to do is to realize things that I'm doing to waste my time. So I figured out that uh, I thought I was checking Twitter for three minutes in the middle of the afternoon and I ended up wasting 30 minutes habitually. And I discovered that. Um, I discovered that uh, when I context switch multiple times in a day, I was going home exhausted. So it was depleting my oxygenated glucose. And if I was to look at how I work today to how I did before, I can see a fundamental shift in how I've grown and developed. So coming back to your career progression, um, there's a couple of elements inside here. One is, hey, we don't really know what to do to get better. We think we do, but we're, uh, we don't really analyze ourselves overly well. So having the right tips right there being able to learn from others of the best practice and get that into your hand every morning so you can make those steps in progression. Another one is actually, and this is a play and it should be in the employee's control to actually do this, is gaining the visibility, especially when you're at a distance work. One of the things that causes a lot of consternation to employees is I'm not seen. Does anybody know that I'm working or not working today? And by using um, some of the work tech tools that are out today, you should have the option to actually let your manager know, hey, here's actually what's really going on. Here's what's going on. And that visibility, I, we call it to be seen, you need to be seen. I know that's kind of a play on words inside there, but you have to let somebody know. You have to have that visibility and transparency. And um, there's a whole aspect of proximity and how that drives promotions in a workplace. So people that are closer to a manager or directors tend to get promotions compared to those that don't have that proximity to interaction. The data and the AI can bring that together to where that proximity, even if you don't have it physically, actually becomes relevant into the picture. We do a lot of work uh, on uh looking at the impact of analytics, AI, and automation, which actually come together quite often. And when you look at the impact of COVID, so one of the things we are seeing is accelerating need for improved analytics and improved levels of automation. That's a double-edged sword, however, right? Uh, when you're looking at things like a robotic process automation, where you kind of scrape screen, automate processes, that can change how people work. It can eliminate certain jobs. And that's not a secret. What really is needed is a creative leadership so that the worker community, and this is, a COVID is accelerating this, but it was pre-COVID in terms of reality, so that the worker community can evolve based on uh, growing levels of automation and growing levels of analytics. Another thing that we see that, that uh, I think is sort of what was already uh, Tom uh, brought it up, really. Sharing data. You have more data to use. How do you see it? What, what's relevant to you? A lot of people, at least in technology, you know, classically, they got defined by their tools. You know, uh, My joke used to be when we did consulting, um, I grew up in Tenafly, and um, uh, oh, shoot, I'll forget the singer's name. I'll think of it in a moment. Um, but she, she created It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To. Um, I know I'll think of it after this meeting. Anyway, she was in my high school. When we did consulting, my joke was, it's my data and I'll cry if I want to. Because people didn't want to share it. They wanted to cling to what they had. So this, we're facing a lot of transformative uh, uh, changes in terms of what people share, what people know, what people think, and how they define themselves. That can be for the good, but it does take creative leadership. Uh, and the last point I'll make on, on democratizing is, sure, when I started with IBM in 1981, we actually got typewriters, right? And, it's, uh, pre and we had uh, all, our, all our equipment was provided. All of it was there. Um, based on the data we have, most of it is still business provided. But there was an equality in just all showing up in the same place 
working together and sharing that information and you know whose internet connectivity is better who's got the you know i'm my computing now is all my own things it does change so those are my two three or four cents per moment yeah um oh go ahead no go ahead okay I want to share my experience in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we, we are a very typical Silicon Valley culture, and uh, I feel the personal affiliation is very important uh, for our team. Uh, before the COVID, we have very good, very close relationship with our team. Uh, you know, we go lunch together, after work, we go for a drink. Like those, all of a sudden, that kind of a personal component disappeared. Uh, even though, uh, you know, we, we still commute, we still uh, work out very well remotely uh, uh, with my team spread out in, in Silicon Valley. But that kind of personal touch, I feel that is desperately needed. It will actually cause, I can, I can call it kind of a professional psychological problem uh, uh, in terms of not seeing your colleagues, you know, uh, you know, I, it's very comfortable. You know, I don't have to talk to them every day, but when I turn around my head, you know, we share the same room with the desk, right? Um, when I turn around my head, you know, I know, I know somebody's around me. I feel very comfortable. Now I turn around, you know, you know, I don't see anybody. So the psychological impact I mean, on the professional side, you, you can talk about career development, that will be very hard to solve. You know, I know it's a double-edged sword, right? In the meantime, you, you increase product productivity, you cut the cost, you know, we're limited our office. We don't have an office anymore now. You know, it's not save us 100K. But still, I think the, um, the personal touch, the benefit personal touch probably outweighs the cost saving uh, that, that we have. Go ahead, Lena. my point. Oh, no, I, I, I think that's, that's actually a great point that I'd love to talk about further is, uh, you know, what does the future of a hybrid workforce look like then for, for this group and the way that you think about this in your work? Um, there are clearly pros and cons. And so, but actually, is there a way in which a hybrid model is maybe ends up being the worst of both worlds because it's neither fully remote and with that kind of flexibility, but it's not the kind of place of equity that Dennis is talking about where everyone was in the office with the same kind of culture. I mean, yeah, I'm curious what what you will think. Well, I can, if you don't mind, I jump in on this uh, first. I, I can share with you what uh, we're doing in China because, you know, as, as you know, the COVID happens first in China. Um, we started having like uh, people convene like once a week. Uh, so the rest of the time, because, you know, the traffic also, you take a lot of, uh, it's, it's a, one of the major cities in China. It's the commuting time is very long. So we can save them about two hours per day. So that they can, uh, their productivity actually increased about 10, 15, 20% every day. But still, uh, one day or two, they will come to the office. They still kind of keep that kind of team-oriented touch. So you can have lunch, you know, they can collaborate, ask questions, uh, you know, share the problems and find the solutions like that. Yeah, we find it to be actually pretty good. Kind of get getting the benefit of both ends. The hybrid yeah. workforce is one of those examples of uh, I'm going to be a futurist for a moment. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So on one side, we like the flexibility. On one side, we want to control the hours that we work. On one side, we want to control where we work from. But the trade-off in the midst of that is exclusion not having the human energy that you're around all of the time. Um, looking at it from multiple points of view, there's multiple stakeholders, there's a cost stakeholder, so a shareholder return in it. There's a company management aspect of it. There's the employee aspect, there's generational dimensions in this. Um, and, and less companies use fantastic work tech and change the ways that they're working today. We're going to end up with, um, a very bipolar environment, and it's probably going to fail spectacularly. And if we were to even go back through uh, the last decade and look at major companies that have attempted to do some aspect of hybrid from the Yahoo's to the IBM's to the others, every one of those ended up reversing that practice. And they reversed it before because of the fact that on one side, there is the choice that matters a lot to people and that flexibility, but we lose the combustionable nature of ideas being generated and the the deepening of the relationship is not with the brand of the company. It's with the people that you work with inside the company. And it doesn't seem that we're close to resolving these yet. 
there's a, a fundamental disconnect um, that the pandemic identified. And that's that we have a workforce that's used to working in a particular way. And it's at arm's length with other people. Now, I, I happen to work in a bunch of different industries. One of my roles manages a portfolio of technology and other companies. So I have people that work all around the world, and they have for over a decade. And I, I've never met my general counsel, but I talk to him four times a day. space with them and and we have not gone through that training with the entire workforce um, and there are people who are predisposed to being okay with working in isolation um, and there are people who are okay with that like I need a window to look out of. I, I just I need to see the outside if I were in a basement room somewhere or in a cubicle I would lose lose it very quickly um, my son would rather work outside than be inside. And those are the types of things that you know we need to consider. And when, when we're looking at, at COVID and the pandemic and its impact and what, what's next, there is a component of this that deals with education, reflection, and how do we create opportunities for generative discussion? As Tommy was saying, that, that lack of generative discussion, that back and forth and um, and uh, Kent was talking about the same thing. When, when you don't have that person to the right or left, either virtually or physically, to be able to bounce ideas off of, a gap cre is created. And it's a gap in time, it's a gap in communication, and it's a gap in the social infrastructure of the company. And that will undermine what happens next, not only in the digital economy, but in the economy. Because that will inform how policies are driven, how people are interacting and what decisions they're going to make in terms of their own behavior and the behavior of their elected officials. Well, let me, let me add on to uh, Ted's uh, point. Uh, I, we see one of the benefit of COVID-19 for working from home, not, pe not not having your boss watching you is for the first time you can drink wine at work. Um, I find out one of the marketing ladies were having a conference call. He was, he said he was drinking wine which is perfect, which is okay with us. But that's some, one of the uh, kind of, hum, hum, how do you say, humorous add-on to, uh, to the work style change, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd like to just, if something occurred to me um, as both, um, uh, as you were talking, Kent, and uh, as Ted was talking as well, very personal, but in terms of this dimension, what do we have, how can we work? So, I had a cat that recently passed away. Well, my cat would come and sit with me every time I was writing. If I was on a call, my cat would sit and look up at who I was speaking to and almost chime in. My cat was a kind of partner. And I think one of the things we'll see, and this may be just a humorous aside, but I think it's a real factor, is a growing role for pets <laughs> to participate in the workforce in their way um, I've seen it on, on PBS. I've seen it on news networks where we'll see a cat in the background or a dog in the background. And I do think that part can be a good thing. I, I do miss my cat. And if she were here, I'd, I'd, I'd show her to you now. So, Nina, what, uh, what uh, we're suggesting next time for the next panel, we'll bring a dog or, or uh, a cat to be one of the panelists. Um. Oh, I think Ted was maybe saying something, but was on mute. <laughs> my, my, my dog is is uh, just outside the door right now. So it's usually in my office, and it's eager to be to be, be on track. Yeah. Um, for the last kind of, I guess, five seven minutes, um, I just want to switch gears and talk a little bit about um, when we think beyond the workforce. You know, what are the industries that have seen the biggest leaps in digitization? What's lagging behind, and what's going to really be very different when we emerge from this pandemic. I think, Hassan, um, this might be something that you're particularly knowledgeable on, given your work with multiple different kinds of businesses. Yeah. Can you all hear me okay, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, my video's frozen, so I didn't know. Yeah, it, it, 
I think what we're seeing um, a lot of is is interesting uh, aspects of like adoption first and foremost because one of the things that we we've been noticing is that a lot of folks had this um, phobia, if you will, of digitization and just a digital transformation uh, within the business community, particularly in the small to medium business space. Uh, but what what I think a lot of folks weren't realizing is that where we are today with respect to how quickly you can deploy tools and, and, and you know, with the help of the internet and of course the cloud and, and services that are built upon that, uh, the de deployment has been shrunk to a few days versus what used to typically generally take years, uh, if not at least like months, right? So whether it is the ability for someone to, uh, uh, for example, in within the healthcare space, be able to deploy a telehealth solution within a day or two, considering uh, the type of tools we have available now, or whether it's the ability for for example, a restaurant to be able to start accepting orders online tomorrow because they can no longer have folks come into their Hassan is frozen for me. Is that yeah, he's probably using right. his uh, wireless? So, so it, it's 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 thing, um, from the can you all hear me? Okay, so, sorry if this is cutting off, but yeah, briefly. I think you're you're cutting out, and I can't see video anymore either. I don't know if that's that's true for others on this call. Can you hear me still? Sorry about that. Yep, this is fine now. Just about, yeah. <laughs> okay, how about now? Is this better? <laughs> not, yeah, not, I mean, not, ter not terribly. Yeah, I. But, Maybe let's give it a minute. Um, I, I know Ted, you were, you were mentioning okay. something in the comments. Is there is something you wanted to add? Right. Just as we're looking at the advancing the digital economy, one of the things that um, has gone unspoken is that it's a trillion dollar business across all all continents except Antarctica. That um, the current digital footprint for all consumers is being monetized and capitalized on between large corporations and middlemen. We're talking about the advantages of, you know, being able to be seen and heard. Well, we're generating all of this digital footprint, which is approximately $10,000 per person over the age of 13, and then it increases when you hit age 55 to almost $25,000 a year. So if we had the capacity to shift the monetization so that the people generating the asset, the digital asset, could get it, we could dramatically reduce poverty around the world in a heartbeat. We're not talking about adding more money. We're talking about reassigning money from middlemen who are not adding value to the process and not taking anything away from the corporations who are paying for the, for the data, but allocating it from the purchasers of the data to the consumers who generate the data. And that's one of the discussions that um, right now as we're looking at advancing the digital economy, that has to be addressed in a way that's meaningful for for people and, and not just the, the big corporations or the middlemen. Agreed. I, I want to add on to, if you don't mind, I want to add on to Ted's point. Um, we see benefit the, the in terms of the uh, the redistribution of workforce uh, will be more to the suburb area than the than the more business oriented area. Number one, number two is is more to the outsourcing area. Like in, for our case, we have development team in Ukraine and uh, and China. People are more and more get used to that. You'll see companies. Uh, well, you talk about career development. I think you will see a lot of elimination of uh, local jobs, especially especially in the advanced economy, and more outsourced to developing countries because people are more used to this kind of a remote kind of uh, a work mode. Yeah. 
it certainly happens to us. Uh, you know, we uh, we actually eliminate some some uh, positions here in Silicon Valley because it's super super expensive, uh, and we move to more remote area to like Texas, for example, uh, to uh, to uh, Ukraine and and China. Yeah, but it's on the one hand it's unfortunate, on the other hand is it's good for other people. So it's a balance. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm sorry, one, one last man. Yeah. So Kent brings up an amazing point. I'm not sure who that was. So Kent, Kent brought up an amazing point um, that's inferred, and that's that there's a series of unintended consequences from the use and reuse or redistribution of technology assets. Mm. And one quick example is in China, um, with the infusion of technology in large cities, there was uh, a lot of people from the rural areas and the suburbs leaving to go work in the, the big cities of um, China. And now what's happened with the pandemic, it's created an opportunity for those people to actually go back to the suburbs and rural area. And But the, the impact of people leaving in the first place is that China has had to allocate money for the construction of 1,500 uh, facilities for seniors for assisted living because people have left their families to go into the city where the work was. And the, the, by using remote technology for work, the families in rural and suburb areas can remain more intact. Sorry, thanks. No, that's great. I'm so glad that we've managed to kind of have such a fruitful discussion here. We are um, now at time, um, but, uh, you know, I, if, I'll stop us streaming and, and let everyone get on to other, other panels.